And now I am pleased to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone. Let me begin today by introducing our esteemed panelists. First, Dr. Karen Kim is professor of medicine and vice provost for research and director of the Center for Asian Health Equity at the University of Chicago. Joining her is Dr. Howard Koh, the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. Let's begin with an outline of what we plan to cover in today's webinar. I am going to begin by providing an overview of how the Macy Foundation how the Macy Foundation's webinar series came to be. Um, then I will turn it over to Dr. Howard Coe, who will provide important contemporary overview of bias and discrimination faced by Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, especially over the course of the last year. He will then hand the presentation over to Dr. Karen Kim, who will enlighten us further on the historical background of racism, bias, and discrimination, and the long-standing problem faced by our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander colleagues and patients in our country. Next, our panelists will focus on the three of the four major recommendations that emerged from the Macy Foundation's Conference on Bias and Discrimination. And all of us plan to organize our comments such that we are leaving a um, significant part of today's webinar for question and answers with all of you. We will then conclude our presentation with a preview of um, what is going to take place um, in future webinars, including um, another one scheduled for next week. So very briefly, I would like to review um, how this whole webinar series came to be. In February of 2020, a group of conferees consisting of faculty, residents, students, graduate students, and leaders from medicine, nursing, and healthcare gathered in Atlanta, Georgia to create a set of recommendations to help achieve a very ambitious vision which would impact all of our nation's health professions learning environments from classrooms to the clinical environments in which the next generation is learning and working. We concluded at that conference that all of those learning environments should be diverse, equitable, and inclusive of everyone in them. And that no matter who that person was and what their background was, they should feel as if they belonged, such that everyone who works, learns, or receives care in these learning environments should really truly feel that they belong. This conference has already resulted in a number of very important outcomes, including the four basic recommendations, as well as a series of action items to help achieve those recommendations. We have also had a number of webinars that have already taken place on a variety of topics, including the broad topics related to bias and discriminations, as well as specific situations such as the bias and discrimination in nursing classroom learning environments, addressing how to manage racist patients, the LGBTQ plus inclusion in health professions education, anti-Black racism, and next week we're going to be tackling nursing in the clinical learning environment. Finally, um, this fall the Macy Foundation is planning to launch a podcast series entitled Vital Voices, which will follow up on many of the questions and issues that you and colleagues around the country have posed during this webinar series with important questions um, for all of us to consider further. I'd also like to um, highlight that in December of 2020, the Macy Foundation did 
sponsor a special supplement to academic medicine that features um, the papers that were presented at that conference um, more than a year ago, as well as a number of other um, papers that were included in the special supplement on addressing harmful bias and discrimination. So I wanna thank um, many of you who have attended um, prior webinars and I want to um, get started with today's webinar. And so let me turn things over to Dr. Howard Coe. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Humphrey and welcome everybody. I'm so honored to be part of this very important Macy conference. I've been on the board of the Macy Foundation for a number of years and I am very honored to work with Dr. Humphrey and her wonderful colleagues who helped coordinate and launch this very important webinar. I'm also very grateful to share this platform with my dear friend, Dr. Karen Kim from the University of Chicago. So it's fair to say that ordinarily issues of discrimination and prejudice against Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are, are invisible in this country. We don't hear much about it. People don't talk about it and how it relates to the health setting is generally overlooked. But as we all know, in the last year through COVID and now hopefully post COVID, uh, we are having some very explicit discussions about how issues of uh, race and bias and discrimination uh, are being handled in this country, in society in general and the health setting in particular. On this first slide, you will see that a very important database was set up at San Francisco State University a year ago, just as COVID was starting and Professor Russell Jung and colleagues have been collecting since then some very early data on incidents of discrimination against the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community from March of 2020 to March of 2021. Uh, you can see some very disturbing outcomes here. Uh, over 6,000 incidents uh, reported. This is definitely an underestimate. Uh, much of it is very public and captured through cameras that are public. And we see these issues highlighted in the news lately. Uh, much of it relates to verbal harassment with xenophobic slurs. And in the midst of COVID, a, a lot of discrimination directed against Americans of Asian descent. Uh, some of it has to do with actual physical assault as you can see on this slide. Some of it affects uh, discrimination at the workplace. And we are now seeing that hate crimes in general reported to the police have increased dramatically uh, because uh, of some, a lot of the background issues related to the pandemic. Next slide, please. For the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, this really uh, had a tremendous impact on this particular day, March 16th in Atlanta, when a man went to three separate spas in Atlanta and shot dead uh, eight people. Six were American women of Asian descent. And it just created an outcry within our community, as you can imagine. A lot of concern that women in particular were targeted and that this was related to a lot of the tension around the pandemic and concerns about uh, xenophobia. Next slide. And very importantly to all of us, uh, these concerns about racism and bias do not exclude our own healthcare community. So here we see pictured on the left, a story about a Mount Sinai medical student who's holding the microphone in the center, who was on her way to get a vaccine before going to work actually in a hospital and was subjected to both verbal assaults and physical assaults. Uh, and so the irony that we have healthcare workers of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander background on the front lines caring for people with COVID, but also vulnerable to these attacks is just absolutely unacceptable. So she uh, organized a rally and a response. And you can see over on the right, members of the Mount Sinai health community and others speaking out uh, against this. So at this point, let me turn this over to Dr. Kim because she's gonna tell you that this is just one chapter of a long history of discrimination and bias against the Asian American community in this country that's lasted over many, many years. Karen? Thank you, Dr. Ko. And I'm so pleased to be sharing the 
the podium with you, Dr. Ko, um, and you have heavily influenced my career, and it's great to be together. And thank you, Dr. Humphrey, for inviting us to be here today. So as Dr. Ko mentioned, there's really been a significant rise in publicly reported hate against Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native American communities. And there's been a real renewed sense of advocacy. But I think it's really important to know that there has been a long and storied history of racism, discrimination, xenophobia, and hate against our populations. And it's important to understand these. So the, the, on this slide, um, I'm gonna share four examples which are pictured here. You may have heard that Asian Americans have been labeled the model minority due to our perceived uniform economic and professional success. This model minority myth serves really as a ra racial wedge pitting minority groups against each other as seen in the cartoon depicted where Irish, German, Italian, and African-American citizens are lynching a Chinese man. Further, this model minority stereotype really masks a history of much more virulent racism and discrimination. And it really became popular, popularized during the civil rights movement as an example of how one minority group can be successful. During the eight, to the late 1800s, there was an increase in immigrants from China, largely due to significant economic hardships in China and the ability of a labor workforce that was growing in the United States. These Chinese immigrant workers were really living in suboptimal conditions, performing hard and underpaid labor. But there was a growing sentiment among non-Asian laborers that we were in a period of yellow peril, unclean and unfit Chinese for citizenship, resulting in riots such as the Chinese massacre in 1871 in LA that killed 17 Chinese men and boys. And this ongoing rise in xenophobic propaganda about Chinese fueled the passage of the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act, the first law in the United States that barred immigration solely based on race. And this persisted in various forms until 1943, when immigrants from China were capped at 105 individuals allowed to come into the country every year. And it wasn't repealed until 1965. In 1942, Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which authorized the removal of individuals of Japanese ancestry who were seen as a threat to the US security because of the war. And they were moved from the West Coast to relocation centers. In fact, over 120,000 Japanese Americans were interned in 10 camps, living in really deplorable conditions without heat or air conditioning. And really the saddest, most tragic part were that two thirds were US citizens and all lost their jobs and businesses. And a hundred years later, after the Chinese Exclusion Act on June 19, 1982, a Chinese American man named Vincent Chin went with friends to a strip club in Detroit to celebrate his upcoming wedding. And that night, two white men who apparently thought Chin was Japanese beat him to death. Shockingly, the killers received each a $3,000 fine and zero prison time. This really light sentencing, sentencing sparked a national outrage and fueled a movement for pan-Asian American rights. But why might these facts be a surprise to you? Because we don't teach Asian American history in schools, but I'm hopeful that this will change. Jennifer Gong Gershwitz, one of the co-founders of AAPI Hate, a third generation Chinese American and Illinois state representative sponsored a bill called Teaching Equitable Asian American History Act or TEACH which was passed through both the House and Senate in Illinois, and we're waiting for our governor to sign this into law, which would mandate elementary and high school students to be taught a unit on Asian American history. Illinois will be the first state in the country to have this law, and I'm proud of our state. Next slide. It's also very important to understand the numerous problems faced by Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. And I've listed a few on this slide. We're regarded as a perpetual foreigner or an outsider. I can't tell you how many times a month I'm told by somebody that I speak English really well, as if somehow I shouldn't. I was born in this country. There's also persistent stereotypes, including the model minority myth that I talked about. And this can lead to a sense of invisibility. 
um, despite being um, one of the most diverse populations in the US and the most fastest and the fastest growing racial group, somehow we still are not included or at the table often when discussions of diversity and inclusion are, are um, talked about. We also have a, a profoundly heterogeneous population with over 50 um, ethnic groups and speaking over 100. It looks like um, Karen has, um, there you go, Karen, are you back on? Education and home ownership, and this impacts the way that we, um, um, that disease might present. And I think the most important thing is that if you look at Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander data, it's limited, it's aggregated, or it's non-existent. And we make up about 7% of the U.S. population, but only 0.17% of National Institutes of Health Research funding. And so if there's no data, there's no problem. If there's no problem, there's no policies. And we're here to talk about this. And we really are underrepresented in leadership positions despite being 20% uh, of graduating medical school classes. Next slide. I'm going to move now to recommendations developed by the Macy Conference on addressing harmful bias and eliminating discrimination in health professions learning environments and discuss how these recommendations can be specifically adapted to address the unique issues affect affecting Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander individuals in health professions, schools, and in the healthcare system. So recommendation one is that we need to build an institutional culture of fairness and respect and anti-racism by making diversity, equity, and inclusion a top priority. And I think under this are three sub-recommendations, including thinking about our mission and culture to make our health professional education and healthcare more inclusive. And really the stop starts both at the bottom from advocacy as well as the top down. And I think that this has been um, something that we're seeing uh, more often of, um, a demand among our medical students to really think about their education to be able to serve these vulnerable populations. We talked at length about dispelling the model minority myth, and this is critical to, be allow, to allow us to be um, included in these discussions. And finally, I think it's very important that we um, think about how we can expand Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders in leadership. We represent only about 4% of medical school deans, despite um, being 20% of the graduating class of medical students in this country. Of those 4%, none are women. So I think we can do better. We need to think about how to be more culturally competent in thinking about leadership. I'm going to turn this uh, back over to Dr. Co to continue presenting our recommendations for addressing bias and discrimination against our communities and individuals. Dr. Ko. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim. So let me review now recommendation two to develop, assess, and improve systems to mitigate harmful biases and to eliminate racism and all other forms of discrimination. Just the fact that we're having this conversation is very important because as you're gonna hear over and over again, usually the issues affecting our community are just never mentioned. Uh, we are often invisible. So one very important way to do that is to use best practices to report the most accurate data and make that available to health professionals who identify as a, a NHPI. It's really important to stress that we are not a monolithic homogeneous community, but we are profoundly heterogeneous as Karen has mentioned. We have a tremendous diversity with respect to language, culture, religion, land of origin, as you've seen from the statistics that Karen has shown. Uh, we need to emphasize fairness in assessment of medical students and trainees right now and make sure the systems for assessment are fair and recognize diversity. Uh, there are a lot of potential hidden biases that are involved in assessing performance of medical students and house staff and faculty. For example, there was a study in JAMA Internal Medicine about four or five years ago looking at the membership of the AOA Honor Society in medical schools. And the investigators concluded that when you held all other factors uh, in consideration, uh, 
students of color, particularly of black and Asian American background were underrepresented, potentially raising questions of bias. So that needs to be explored. And then collaboration over on the right is hugely important. You know that the uh, medical student, the very courageous medical student who was assaulted, stepped forward and organized a public response and spoke at the rally and brought the uh, Mount Sinai hospital community together, of course. And we have to do that within the healthcare and public health community. And then I think we can also recognize and collaborate with some very important national organizations that I've had the pleasure of working closely with in my career as a physician and public health professional. Just to mention two, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum uh, based in San Francisco in DC is headed by my dear friend, Julia Choi. They are perhaps the leading organization nationwide tracking public health and healthcare issues uh, for patients and for our community broadly. So working uh, with them is very important and they also have a finger on the pulse of what's going on in Washington and the new administration. So that's a very valuable ally. And another great organization I've worked closely with and I'm very proud to mention them is the Association of American Pacific Community Health Organizations, the community health centers in the country that care specifically for AA and HPI populations with a special emphasis on language access, on having materials in multiple languages, uh, being very sensitive to the issues that immigration uh, raise for the patients we care for and care about. And those are just some of the collaborators that we can work with as we develop these themes. Next slide, please. And then uh, recommendation three to integrate these themes explicitly into health professions curricula and talking about equity as it relates to our populations. So starting with awareness, we should be talking about this every day at our workplace and in our hospitals and in our healthcare sitting, settings and where we learn and teach uh, and share a commitment to improving health in our society. I think uh, if you drill down on all the themes that have been presented so far, so much of the bias and discrimination that we see unfortunately right now in the era of COVID is because people judge other people and presume and assume things about our community when they shouldn't. And so we can all start ourselves by acknowledging the implicit bias that we all have. And when you meet an Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander colleague or care for a patient, don't assume anything. anything. Don't assume where they are born, what their background is, their language is spoken. Don't assume anything about their spouse, their sexual orientation. Ask if you don't know and, and don't assume because we are a very heterogeneous uh, population. All these concerns spill over into patient care, of course. And the more you get to understand patients of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, background and respect them for their unique life experience and not assume anything, you are moving toward true patient-centered care in a very powerful way. And then if cases regarding the AANHPI community can be written up and presented and discussed in curricula, that also raises awareness and improves efforts toward true health equity. Next slide. Let me end with some hope in terms of movement on the national scene, uh, because of the crimes that have been re reported through the Stop AAPI hate efforts and the leadership of some colleagues in Congress, on May 20th, President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law. A lot of this was specifically in response to the March 16th shootings in Atlanta. Uh, many of you may know that I'm the former Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama administration. So I've had the great pleasure of meeting and working with many of the leaders standing up and sitting behind the president here. This act was introduced into Congress uh, in the Senate by Senator Maisie Hirano, who's, who's in the blue over on the right. And then to her right, a co-sponsored co by Congresswoman Grace Meng of New York. Uh, they are great leaders and I've uh, interacted with them. You also see behind the president, uh, Senator uh, Duckworth, uh, Senator Blumenthal, 
Vice President Harris, of course, who is of Asian background. And then very importantly, right behind the president, Congresswoman Judy Chu, who's been the chairman of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus for the last decade and a wonderful leader. I've had the great honor of working closely with her when I was in DC. And then over on the right, also in May, President Biden signed an executive order establishing the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in his administration. Many of you may know that this White House Initiative started under President Clinton, has continued under each successive administration. Under President Obama, I had the incredible privilege of working closely with the White House uh, Initiative and saw great movement on issues like improving health insurance coverage for the AANHPI community. And so with this executive order, I think we're gonna be seeing much more attention to addressing these hate and discrimination issues that are plaguing our society right now. So at this point, let me turn it back to hum Dr. Humphrey. Ah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ko, and thank you, Dr. Kim, very much. I'd like to um, invite um, Peter Goodwin to um, sort through um, the questions that um, I'm inviting you to put into um, the chat. So, um, Peter, let me turn it to you. Thank you, Holly. Um, as a reminder to all the attendees, the chat function uh, is now enabled. So uh, you will be chatting with all panelists and all attendees, and we encourage you to use that to share information about best practices or comment on anything that you've heard so far. In addition, the Q&A function on your Zoom screen is active. Uh, you can start using that now to pose questions to the panelists. And seeing no questions right now, I'll take the prerogative as, um, as the, the uh, one of the moderators of this is to pose one myself um, uh, to both Dr. Ko and Dr. Kim. Um, such a rich presentation that we heard. Um, I'm thinking of for people who are at health profession schools, whether they be administrators or faculty or students, of all the things that they could do to begin to address bias and discrimination, where do you think is the best place for them to start? So I can begin if you want, and I'd love to hear from Karen too, of course. I think simply raising the issue and raising awareness that uh, these challenges are occurring in our society with respect to discrimination and frank hatred that uh, are not just verbal insults, as Karen has alluded to, but also physical assaults reflects a lot of uh, xenophobia that has been a tragic outcome from the COVID pandemic. And then uh, bringing attention to the issues in, in all our discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then also re requesting and demanding accurate data. As Karen has mentioned, and I'm sure she will say more, the data around AANHPI health issues is very sparse. And it's very frustrating because when you look for data on our community with respect to health or anything else in our society, uh, oftentimes uh, there's no data at all, or other, other times we are put into the other category. By the way, if you look at the way race has been classified in our country every decade from 1790 on, uh, for many of those classifications, uh, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders have been in the other category. And oftentimes the data is aggregated, so we don't know how uh, the specific major ethnicities like Chinese American, Japanese, Korean American, uh, and others um, fare in terms of outcomes. And so requesting more granular data, public data, and making sure this is all part of discussions about equity in our country is very, very important. Karen? Yeah, I would echo um, everything that you said. I, I think the, the, the starting point is just to be at the table. And I think that often when um, institutions think about climate survey or um, diversity, inclusion and belonging, um, somehow we are made to feel that we don't belong. And so I think it's really important that there is um, an opportunity for um, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander representation in those discussions. And I think that's a really important beginning. 
you know, as Howard mentioned, I think data really drives, um, um, informs us of so many things. And I think the way the data collected it is being collected is a challenge because I think um, you know, about 35% of our populations are limited English proficient. And if those, uh, the, if we collect data from people like me um, who were born here and speak English, um, that misses about 65% of what represents this um, community in the United States because it's still a largely foreign born population and will continue to be over the next 50 years. So being able to collect the right data on the right individuals, I think is really important. And so strategies to be able to do that are important. When I think of the work that we did to sign people up for the um, Affordable Care Act with community-based navigators who were both um, integrated, um, bicultural, bilingual navigators, I mean, it really uh, decreased a lot of the eliminated disparities. And so I think we need to think about partners in being able to think about um, um, uh, this space as well. Thank you. We have a number of questions now coming in and I'll, we'll start getting to them now. Um, picking up on your last point, Karen, um, there's a question about creating allies that will continue to move the needle forward when the initial interest that exists right now may die down. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this is um, uh, sort of a communities of color um, dialogue. And I think that it's not enough to just represent yourself and the people that look like you or from your community. I think it's really important that this is done in collaboration and, um, and sort of in allyship with other communities of color. Um, I, I know I mentioned earlier, for instance, the, the TEACH Act that may go into law in Illinois to make sure that uh, Asian American history is included in um, high, middle school and high school education. I think that that act doesn't just focus on Asian American history, but it's inclusive of it. it. It also wants to talk about LGBTQ rights and other marginalized populations. And so I think it's about being included in these discussions, but also um, um, being inclusive of other communities who may suffer many of the same um, um, discrimination and, and hatred. Yeah, and if I can add, I, I did mention these two wonderful national organizations, um, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum and Julia Choi, who's the CEO for the uh, Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, APCHO, their wonderful CEO is Jeff Caballero, another tremendous leader. So if you reach out to colleagues and organizations like that, that, that helps build a national effort. Uh, the White House initiative under Biden is now going to be drilling down on these themes and looking for collaboration. Uh, the partners Karen mentioned is really important. And then very important of all, uh, I probably should have said this at the very beginning, and we can all use this as a talking point. Our, our country in general is getting more heterogeneous by the day. And in fact, it's projected that by 2045, we will be a majority min minority nation. So these issues uh, affect all of us and we have to prepare for our country becoming even more diverse and heterogeneous, um, even more multicultural, but make sure that in the midst of all that, each patient gets the care that you can deserve. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from a faculty member. Um, and the question is, how can we start to build a curriculum that addresses the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander issues? Yeah, so I, I think um, at the University of Chicago under the leadership of one of my colleagues, Monica Vela, and when um, Dr. Humphrey was um, Dean of the medical school, um, we created, uh, we were one of the, I think the first medical school in the country actually to address issues of um, disparities, health disparities as really a foundational um, curriculum to address kind of the, the very rapidly changing population and the need to teach our medical students to be prepared for um, addressing diverse populations. And within that curriculum, we included, um, um, we included Asian American um, health disparities as part of that curriculum. And I think that has really served as, as kind of um, a trailblazing um, curriculum um, for medical students and really could be used as a model for how we build up 
um, educational resources and inclusive education for addressing the needs of our students and our patients. And so I do think that there are um, some good models out there that allow us to utilize um, existing resources to continue to talk about disparities within Asian Americans. Um, I think that probably there is no need to start from scratch, but to um, use resources that are already available. Thank you. Uh, this next question um, gets at the pipeline issue. Um, as you've pointed out, Asians comprise 20% of medical school graduates, but only 4% of medical school deans. Um, it's a pipeline problem. How does one promote the career development of Asian Americans when those in current leadership positions may not view this as a pressing issue? Well, I can just start and then I'll pass it to Howard because he probably has more experience in this than I do. But I can tell you that we have to be data driven. So if, if and we have to believe the data that we see. So I, I think that there's clearly a very big gap between um, those individuals who are faculty, senior faculty, and actually being able to achieve leadership. And so one, one of the challenges is how do we define leadership? You know, what are the stereotypes that stop Asian Americans and Pacific, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders from crossing over into leadership positions? What are the assumptions that are being made and, and um, sort of the uh, both implicit and explicit bias? And I think we need to address that. And I think we need to look at data that, that includes um, our populations when you're looking at where the gaps are in leadership. I'm gonna turn and ask Howard to comment. Well, Karen, uh, we want to thank you for your leadership in the Midwest and nationwide. You, you're doing such a great job. Uh, if I can say very personally, I am now a professor of the practice of public health leadership at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And many of you may know that in addition to being the Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama Administration, I was the Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health. If I can just say for most of us, when we do anything at all, we are often the first. <laughs> so I've sort of gotten used to that in my career. I was the first uh, Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health of Asian American and Korean American background, the first Asian American Assistant Secretary for Health. I think when you have those incredible opportunities, if you can lean in, as I tried to do in those posts and reach out and send the message that our community uh, needs to be represented. And it's important to be the first, but what's more important is that there's a second and a third and a fourth and so on. Uh, now that I teach public health leadership, I encourage my students to, to explore what is unique and different about them and really leverage that in the work they are doing because that makes you memorable and different, which is actually a good thing. I know when I was younger, I wasn't sure being of minority background was a positive, but especially in my field of public health, being different uh, makes you memorable and makes you uh, more eligible to make a unique contribution to leadership. So those are some of the things I try to impart to my students now. And I'd like to think that's important to this webinar and to many other presentations that the Macy Foundation is hosting. Thank you. Um... So Dr. Kim and Dr. Ko, you both mentioned the importance of data in, um, in uh, addressing this issue. Um, what do you see as the infrastructure challenges or changes that need to happen at institutions in order to both capture but to harness the power of this data? Um, I, can, I can start. I, I know that... Um... I've been very interested in understanding the contributions of community-based organizational partners in being able to contribute um, data on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders in Chicago. And we have, uh, largely because there's so little granularity in, in data that's currently existent. And the data that is there, a lot of the national data does not well represent these limited English kind of vulnerable populations and communities. But if you think about the work, the incredible work that community-based organizations do in serving these populations uh, and the data that they collect probably on a daily basis, I feel like it's a missed opportunity. And so what we're trying to do is uh, think of a way to put together a data warehouse, 
um, that bridges um, both national data, local data, and then community-based data into a one place and think of a way that people can actually have access to it. So if you actually have data and you hold it for yourself, it really doesn't achieve anything. Um, and so making data accessible is really important in a way that people can understand. And so broad partnerships, kind of a novel infrastructure um, that allows us to use technology to sort of uh, look at a more regional, um, even national approach to sharing kind of relevant data that's disaggregated and that really represents these vulnerable populations. Yeah, and Karen mentioned the absolute key themes here. We have to have the data available. It's gotta be disaggregated. It's gotta be granular. So we know it applies to our specific community because if you put it all together and aggregate it, you can make all kinds of assumptions about all sorts of uh, ethnic subgroups of the AANHPI community and they don't apply. So too often we see data pr presented and our community is just not represented at all. And as Karen said earlier, when there's no data, people assume there's no problem and that just makes our invisibility issue worse. So starting with that very basic request and demand for granular data tracking it through COVID and beyond, by the way, if you, if you look for good racial ethnic granular data through COVID, it was a struggle for many, many months. And we just cannot have that again when these public health crises are threatening us now and in the future. Uh, thank you. The issue of uh, recruitment and career development is coming up in a number of questions. Um, have you come across any model strategies or best practices? Sorry, that, that may, uh, that you would be able to highlight? Yeah, so this is a tough question. You know, there, there really isn't, <clears throat> um, this is a population in general that doesn't fit into uh, underrepresented in medicine um, category. Um, and so uh, actually it, it's, it's a very hard population in general, I'm speaking in general, to understand um, how to look and track um, success of um, early stage investigators or um, um, postdocs um, it, it's very difficult for us to understand what type of programs to put together to reach out to these populations. What we are following right now, which is really um, unfortunate, is um, at least from um, a research perspective, is the high rates of concern because of foreign influence um, and the impact that has on our um, global uh, research as well as many of our trainees and early faculty who may not who, who may be from China or other parts of Asia. And I think that that's been a, a real challenge. I, I think that if you look at um, among underrepresented mi minority populations in general, sort of what allows or predicts whether you can recruit these individuals to your campus, it seems to fall under three categories. One is, your location. So maybe you won't go to a place where there is not a diverse population because of just life. You know, you want to live your life with people who, who may share similar experiences. The other is sort of being able to be at a place that has um, achieved high academic standards. But the third is sort of this concept of kind of social enrichment. So what, what opportunities do you provide um, these individuals to be able to feel like they're part of, of a community? We, we, I, don't, I can't say that I've seen that done the same way for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander faculty or students. And I think we really need to do better and it needs to be data driven. I want to add to that, um, Karen, because I agree with those of you who are raising this very important question related to the pipeline. And I think in addition to the um, themes that Karen um, emphasized, I think it's very important to um, be, be strategic. And what I mean by that is I think that to unplug the pipeline, um, so to speak, and to really develop and nurture that pipeline, um, we need to have efforts that are focused um, kind of from the ground up, um, taking advantage of the experiences that our students bring to our health profession schools because they are generally filled with ideas and with experiences that we can all learn from and, and really giving the students the support to 
act on um, at least some of the good ideas that they have related to the pipeline. And then I think the leadership of the institution has a real responsibility to be intentional about their commitment to real diversity for their leaders, for their faculty in general, for their students, for the other um, health care providers in the institution, and to be very intentional about the patients um, who, they're, who they're caring for. So I think it has to come from the ground up and from the top down. Well said, definitely. That's the case. Beautifully, beautifully said. So I'd um, like to move now into the clinical care setting. Uh, we have a question um, from an individual who's curious about the clinical care provided to the community of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and what healthcare practitioners can do from a clinical standpoint to help close the gaps. This well, is a, a really, really important question. I know that Dr. Karen Kim has some very direct personal experience with um, addressing this and setting up some specific programs related to it. So um, Karen, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I, I think this is, um, this is a really um, challenging and interesting um, um, problem, I think. Um, I think for several reasons. One, um, about 30% of Asian Americans are limited English proficient. So if you don't have a health system that allows you to work with an interpreter or some type of uh, interpreter service, uh, that's a really a, a big challenge. And, and we know that um, often in our education, we don't even train our students or our, our residents or fellows how to work with interpreters. And so you see all kinds of crazy things happening. So, you know, making your health system sort of um, capable of looking at diverse populations is really important. You know, in one of our primary care clinics, we have no phones in the room, so you can't even do a three-way call. So if you have a patient who doesn't speak English, you can all hear the interview because it has to be done in the hallway. And that's not the provider's problem. That's just the system is not set up to allow you to deliver the right kind of care. The other thing is there is zero, there are zero articles looking at shared decision-making, which among Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. And that's really uh, the, the critical component of being able to get into a common ground with your patient to make a decision. And, and we just don't even know how to do that in these communities because really we haven't studied it. And so I think that um, um, I can tell you that one thing for sure, if you don't know, as Howard mentioned, you, you shouldn't make assumptions and you should just ask. I think we people can be very forgiving. If you don't understand something, if you think something is culturally nuanced, if it's a, a situation that you're unsure of, just ask. You know, I think just the, the sort of the very basic human element and the ability to forgive yourself if you don't know something, that's okay. It's better than making assumptions. And I think that's really the bottom line. And when I think about delivery of healthcare to a population that you may not be familiar with, I think that's, a, that's something that, that we always think about. We, we opened a, um, the first free clinic serving um, limited English Chinese proficient um, patients at the University of Chicago a few years ago. And what we've become is a training ground for residents and fellows from across the institution who really have never really worked with an interpreter in any formalized way. So sometimes this education surprisingly is from the ground up because it's our medical students who are doing a lot of the training. Howard, I don't know if you have other things that you wanna to mention. Yeah, so those are excellent comments by Karen and um, I'm just gonna reinforce some themes by saying in general, as we all know, issues of trust in our community with the healthcare system are pretty substantial. And of course, this affects all patients who come from communities of color. But with respect to our community, that's so heterogeneous and two thirds of us being foreign born and many of us not having English as our first language, all, all the trust issues can get more magnified. So any effort to build trust, to not assume, to ask questions and to listen, to, to make sure there is understanding and uh, some effort to acknowledge and uh, support health literacy for the patient in front of you is very, very uh, important. Uh, and so some of, the th some of those themes are, are cr critical. If I can mention one theme from the public health arena that makes me very proud, in fact, we should all be very proud of this. Uh, when I was in the Obama administration and the Affordable Care Act was being rolled out, 
And we were all concerned whether Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander groups could get health insurance coverage through the Affordable Care Act. And a lot of people just threw up their hands and said, oh, this is impossible. You know, you need multilingual navigators and assisters and outreach and foreign language and materials and those sorts of logistic issues that seem absolutely overwhelming. But the advocates and the professionals around the country uh, from groups I mentioned and others really rallied around. And do you know that we were able to do a study that showed that the AANHPI community was, was able to increase their health insurance coverage and close the gap between them and uh, the, the, the white uh, non-Hispanic population in the United States. So disparities can be overcome and even eliminated in this case, this was up till 2016, so we need more data, but equity is possible if we make the commitment, commitment and really recognize the particular needs of the communities that we're trying to serve. Thank you. This next question um, returns us to the data uh, theme. Um, how are you able to obtain the data regarding Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander medical school deans? Is there also data on department chairs and other leadership positions? You know, that's a, a, a great question. Um, um, Plus One just put out a, a paper um, looking at sort of what is the phenotype of medical school deans, you know, and, and within that, on the first table, they give the breakdown of, of the number of, um, of, of those who answer their survey, sort of what percentage broken down by race, ethnicity, and gender, and years of experience. Um, and so that's probably the most recent data that looks at the breakdown of um, deans across the country. Um, I, I don't know, and, um, and maybe Hallie or Howard would know, I don't know if AAMC has um, data right now that's been reported on chairs. Um, and when I've looked at um, AAMC data, um, what I've mainly seen is um, sort of underrepresented minority versus kind of non-Hispanic white. And I haven't seen too many Asian categories. Um, certainly I haven't seen it broken down by kind of um, subgroups um, either. The, Thank the, you. Yeah, the one thing I'll add to that um, is there is a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. Um, uh, the lead author is Thomas H. Lee. And in that paper, um, there is a table um, that actually has a more detailed breakdown of um, leaders in academic medicine by race and ethnicity. Um, it's the most detailed table that I've seen. So again, that is um, lead author Thomas H. Lee. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. And the title of that paper is Diversity and Inclusiveness in Healthcare Leadership, Three Key Steps. Great. Thank you. Um, we are now approaching uh, the top of the hour and we have time for just one more question of the many others I'm sorry we can't get to right now. But the last question is, how do you teach health concerns specific to Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders population without introducing bias? <laughs> Boy, that is a rich and wonderful question. So- um, And we have one minute. <laughs> Dr. Kim, would you like to take a... Well, I mean, I, I, I think that there are certain... The one thing about Asian health that's really unique is there are certain diseases um, that are very different among this population. So hepatitis being one, where, you know, half of all of hepatitis B in the United States are Asian American. Um, and so I think that's just, uh, that, that's just something that, that's a real number. The other area that's really interesting is around uh, looking at um, um, body mass index in Asian Americans. Uh, the American Diabetic Association um, in 2014, um, for the first time, um, uh, created a new guideline just for Asian Americans because we realized that we were missing the opportunity to identify uh, those who are pre-diabetic based on um, sort of the American standard uh, body size um, BMI index. And so um, Asians were sort of labeled as a sort of skinny fat and, with, and at pre-diabetic risk, even at 15 pounds uh, lighter than any other height. So I do think that there's um, certain diseases that tend to be unique among Asian Americans, 
I think that one of the things that I hear a lot from um, people, um, uh, women who've had breast cancer who are Asian American is when they go see their doctor, they say, oh, you know, you're, you're not at risk. You're, you're, you're so healthy. You know, you follow healthcare guidelines. Um, you can't possibly have, you know, this cancer. And, um, and so I do think that that seeps into this model minority stereotype can really influence the way that we choose to follow up with patient-based um, um, concerns. Maybe I don't know if that answered the question well, but I think um, that's sort of a start to this dialogue. Yeah, those are excellent examples. If I can add a couple more, if you look at the cancer world, which is one of the areas I've trained in, uh, we see that, um, for example, liver cancer and stomach cancer are overrepresented in the NHPI population. As, as a Korean American, I've been watching the gastric cancer issues uh, for the Korean American population and um, other Asian American subgroups. And this all has public health ramifications because in fact, uh, I'm an honor to be in some very early discussions with some colleagues from Stanford about the role of cancer screening for gastric cancer for Asian American populations who might be at risk and whether that could be an impetus for a policy change uh, with respect to cancer screening. So stay tuned on that. But the bottom line is the more we get more detailed information, more dedicated research, better data, and outline the problems and special challenges facing our population, the more likely we are to develop effective public health responses. And by the way, one very key major theme here, especially with respect to all the episodes of hate and discrimination is the mental health impacts. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working recently with some very talented young colleagues at, at Harvard who are teaching me about this. And this is one area where the Asian American population in particular has been reluctant to interact uh, with the healthcare system and get the mental health services they need and deserve. So the challenges are many, but the opportunities are rich and the more we can work together and face our own implicit biases as we start in and not assume anything, I think the more we can make public health come alive for our community. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ko and Dr. Kim. Um, I am sorry that we are out of time. I want to thank all of our participants and attendees for the outstanding questions that you have posed. I'm sorry that we did not get to cover all of them, but I want to promise that there will be follow-up. And the follow-up is that today's webinar will be posted next week on the Macy Foundation's website. But in addition to that, we will be having future webinars on this topic to continue this conversation. We'd like, for example, to feature students and nurses um, who have some very specific um, insights and experiences to add to this conversation. We also will feature follow-up um, podcasts, as I mentioned at the outset of today's webinar. Um, you see on the screen in front of you the uh, webinar that we have planned for next week, and um, that webinar will focus on nursing and taking action on harmful bias and eliminating discrimination in the clinical learning environments. That was a source of many questions um, following our first webinar on nursing. We also have future topics uh, teed up that will focus on bias and discrimination related to those who are differently abled, as well as um, ageism and discrimination related to aging in general. So I'd like to thank you all um, for participating today and let me turn it um, back over to Peter. Thank you, Holly. This concludes today's webinar. Um, you can find the conference recommendations on our website at macyfoundation.org, where you can also sign up for periodic email alerts from all of us. Thank you for participating today, and please stay safe and healthy. <laughs>